Assembly 2012. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, one yeah, okay. Nice, nice. Uh, welcome to uh, well, as I said, Assembly 2012, uh, Arts and Tech seminars. Uh, we have great line of speakers here. It was yesterday, today, tomorrow, and it's about one o'clock. And our next speaker is ready. Oh, sorry, I put the mic. Uh, it's Peter. And the uh, next topic will include something about a little bit old school, new school stuff. But one of my favorite topics, I have to say. How to build an arcade cabinet of your own. <laughs> nice. But I have nothing more to add. So give a warm welcome to Peter. That's everybody. Good. Quick introduction of myself. I started with these uh, arcade cabinets in 2009 on a semi professional level. I also play pinball and placed third in the Belgian Championships, which would make me the best player in the hall here, of course. I also organize stuff at Revision. I'm demo scene wise active in RBBS and Accession, and I have a show on scene, shat, scene set called The Arrogant Bastards. That's me. Now, building an arcade cabinet is what we're here for, and it's overall quite easy. You need to do this. Questions? No? Okay, well, let's dumb it down a bit. Arcade cabinet, lo look at it as a computer. You have your input, which are your buttons, a CPU in the middle will calculate stuff and make images and make sound and make things move on the screen. Um, interpret your inputs, put that out to the monitors and the speakers, and for good fun, we have some blinking lights at the top to make it shiny. Now, in between, magic happens, and that's, that's where we will um, focus on the magic. First of all, the input. You know, an arcade cabinet, you, you look at it, it's full of buttons and joysticks and you have, well, maybe not an idea how to connect it. Now, th these things are not really that important. You, you can go even more dumber and that's your new friend, that, that's, that's the micro switch. A normal micro switch has three connectors. Your common, which is your ground loop, the normally closed, which we don't really use in an arcade cabinet, and the normally open. Those are uh, one, two, and three. The com is the long one at the bottom. The normally open is the middle one. Normally closed is the one on the top. To connect all this up, all your commons, your ground wires, you connect to one big single loop. If something is not working in your control panel, say three buttons are not working or one side is not working, usually that's where your problem is. That's your ground loop. If you want to start an arcade repair service here in Finland, you can charge 50 euros for checking that. The normally open, that goes to your CPU, through the cable. That's, you connect to your up, your down, your left, your right, button one, two, three, four, five, six, that goes there into your cabling. And we have Two kinds of cabling here, actually. You have your, your, your JAMA cable and you have an IPAC. They both serve the same purpose. They will transport the electrons from your buttons, your joysticks, into your CPU or to your, or to your arcade board. But then, what's a JAMA cable? JAMA cable is an abbreviation. It's the Japan Amusement Machinery Manufacturers Association. JAMA is a lot easier. It's one standardized cable, which they started implementing in about 85, and it's used for inputs and outputs, which, which kind of confuses people from time to time. That you have your output, you have your, uh, you have your, uh, you have your video, your audio, uh, some statistics for coin counters, the input of the joystick goes in as well, and you have your power, your 12 volt, your 5 volt, and your minus 5 volt, and your ground. 
again, if you uh, little little trick or a little hint, if you have an arcade cabinet and you have no sound, that's your 12 volt missing, usually on the power supply or in a cable. Um, many uh, many boards or many power supplies. That's the first one that dies. That's your 12 volt rail. It's an easy it's an easy uh, fix and. Uh, it solves uh, quite a lot of problems. The minus five isn't really used that much today. It was used on some older games in the 80s, for also for sound. Um, many power supplies won't even have a minus five volt anymore today. And the iPack, something with an eye not made by Apple, they do exist. It has two players, one left, one right, whereas the JAMA cable has support for three buttons per, per player by the standards. An iPad will handle eight. Um, otherwise, it's fully USB, although this one has PS2 connectors. It's actually PS2 over USB that comes with a special cable with it. There is a pass-through. You also have uh, a smaller version of this, which is called the mini pack, which has a breakout cable and a smaller one is pre-cable, but it's, it's the same um, device. Uh, on a lower level. Um, good thing is that this is completely driverless. Uh, as, as you have a recent operating system from the last five, six, seven years, it will recognize it as a uh, universal human interface device, UHID. Uh, it will not, e it's not a keyboard, so it will not register as a keyboard, but it, it, it will act as such. You can program it uh, in, in, in a tool that says, okay, button one gives me an A button, uh, B gives me, gives me a B, etc. Uh, and you, you can test this then in, for instance, Notepad or your favorite text editor quite easy. The editor is, could be quite confusing, but once you get the hang of it, it's, uh, it's, it's workable. So now we have covered the input, output. Uh, three options exist today, mostly. That's an original arcade screen. Uh, a computer monitor, uh, VGA, can be uh, a CRT or LCD or a, a LED panel, and also an older CRT TV which you can adapt and reuse. Original arcade monitor is, is of course, the best. Uh, one, well, one big problem is um, there, there is only one factory left in China which produces them today. Uh, they use lead soldering and so they are not allowed to be imported into the EU. Existing screens may still be used and sold, but um, imagine an old TV which has been on for 15 years non-stop. It's probably dead, and so are most of those screens. Um, also, schematics. Um, whatever hardware was available to make the, the PCB was used, they often the schematics don't, don't match. Um, good thing is, um, recently, the Chinese aftermarket has been uh, has started making the new chassis, the PCBs, which actually control the monitor. Uh, you can you can now buy them for about eighty, ninety dollars plus shipping. You have a new chassis, and if your tube, your glass is still okay, um, don't forget that holds your electron guns, which actually create the picture. Uh, you could still revive a screen in a limited fashion. A computer monitor, that's the second option, and this is when you put the PC in a cabinet is the, is the easiest. Now, if you want a CRT, the big ones are heavy. There's, there's a reason why people switch to panels and L LCDs, they're a lot lighter. They will also work, uh, but do watch out that on the cheaper screens, the, the viewing angle um, has to be quite wide. If you want 180 degrees flat panel, that you have at least a 160, 170 viewing angle. Certainly, if you want to turn it uh, 90 degrees for vertical games, a lot of monitors um, have an OK viewing angle from left to right, but not from top to down. So when you turn that, this, this might, might become an issue. A small thing what you can do with an LCD panel is tilt it a bit forward. It's not really noticeable when you see it uh, in the cabinet, but it, it will help you uh, with your um, gameplay. Um, also, for the older CRT monitors, the big plastic casing, um, you, you have to destroy it and knock it into pieces, and then what you have, what you have left can be used. Uh, you will also not have the standardized mounting, uh, so you would have to do some, some tinkering with, with wood and uh, whatnot to get it to fit. 
Same goes for the CRT TV. It's um, mostly the same technology as an arcade monitor. Same things go here. Um, it's becoming quite hard to find in good condition. Um, and it has some other connection methods, which we, which we can work with. But how do we get there? A um, little bit of theory. You will often see, uh, is it a 15 kilohertz screen or a 31 kilohertz screen? That's um, a topic which comes up mostly. And this is actually the, the, the resolution on a horizontal level. It is in how wide, how many pixels can you show from left to right. If you look at an arcade screen, that's 15 kilohertz. And now, arcade screens use a system called RGB. It's not a fixed resolution. It's like, well, this is an area where you can wobble in, and that's uh, what, you, what, what you go for. Uh, usually, they, they um, um, put it at uh, 50 hertz here in Europe. And for, um, well, more or less 300 lines, this gives you 15,000 times that your electron beam goes left to right. That's your 15 kilohertz. For a VGA screen, it's a higher uh, resolution. Um, if you take your overscan into account, which is the, the area where it, which, which is not visible but is there, multiply that with your uh, hertz rate of 60 hertz for a VGA, you end up at about 31,000, which, which is your 31 kilohertz. Now, as we said, if you take an arcade board and you want to connect that to a TV or an arcade screen, we are in the 15 kilohertz range. That's going to be no problem. We know that now. Same for a PC, you can connect that to a VGA screen. That, that will also work, else well, we wouldn't have assembly here because nobody would see anything. Going from one to the other, that's again is your magic zone. You need video converters. This is, you, you input signal one, can be VGA, and it will output your RGB, your CGA, your, your S video, and going from 31 to 15 kilohertz. They also exist the other way around. Uh, if you have uh, a 15 kilohertz arcade board, you can scale it up. It's not really upscaling, but you can in increase the frequency to 31 or similar and um, do that. These, these boards retail for about 50, 50 to 55 euros. Um, there's a nice on-screen display. It's in Chinese. Uh, language num uh, option number four is language, if you ever buy one of these. You can set it to English. So it's four and one, and suddenly you can see what's happening on the screen. Now, if we don't have a video converter, but we have a JAMA cable, there is, remember the IPAC I showed earlier on? This is the JPEG, which is the JAMA version of the IPAC. It, it has a standard JAMA connector, uh, which, don't forget, has three buttons per player. So it adds on the side, you see, uh, switch four, five, six, seven, eight at the bottom. You can add extra buttons per players. This will also have an input for the PC sound and will put it over your uh, JAMA cable and a, a VGA input uh, and, a, and USB towards the PC to um, connect the video. Um, important fact to know is that this is not a video converter. It converts voltages and there are some Safety is that you will not blow your screen when you put the 31 kilohertz onto a 15 kilohertz screen, um, but it's not intended for um, long-term usage, only for uh, debugging, which are the little red jumpers you see. Uh, this one is configured for 31 and a 15 kilohertz. It will, it will also do 25. 25 kilohertz is an in-between standard mostly used uh, on Sega cabinets in, uh, from the 1990s. Now, we have the JPEG, but don't forget your TV starts off, starts off at 31 kilohertz. You need to get it to 15. If, except for the video converter board, you can do this also with a, specially, a special video card, an uh, arcade VGA, which is a standard off-the-shelf video card, just it has different firmware, which will allow it to output the 15 kilohertz uh, resolutions. Or in software, it's uh, a tool called uh, Soft15. Is because your your video card in your PC, your 
uh, your RAM deck, it can do the 15 kilohertz. It's perfectly capable of doing that, but your driver does not allow the options because, well, you are using a PC uh, screen at 31. So what this does is adds a gazillion registry values on your Windows machine to um, show you all the uh, resolutions. If things go wrong in soft 15 kilohertz, um, you can roll back using the safe mode because that will not load your video driver, but go to a standard driver. And then the third one, the TV. Most TVs, I don't know here in Finland, but in, in Belgium, France, Germany, they have a SCART plug, which is, in general, an, an RGB signal. You can really connect the output of your arcade board, which is also RGB and some sync signals. You can connect it one-to-one -to, -one to a SCART cable. You will have quite a lot of grounds to connect because uh, your red, your green, your blue have their own separate grounds, but you can, all, you can tie them all together. You have to watch out for one thing, is that your arcade board will output a 5-volt signal, while your TV expects a 3.3-volt uh, signal. Um, put some resistors in, in your cable to fix this, or if your TV has some buffer cir circuitry, it will not blow up, or it'll keep working. But keep that in mind. So we have now gone over the, the inputs and the conversion methods and the outputs. So a quick summary in the middle, which this is the easy one for most, most of you and everyone here, is that you start off with your button, your joystick, you put this into your iPad, goes to your PC and, and, and out of your screen. This, this is your most basic arcade cabinet for emulation at home. Um, it's, um, yeah, the easy version. If you say, well, no, I have a CRT screen that I want to use, you start off again with your joysticks and your input to your PC, and then you need to convert it from a 31 to a 15 kilohertz again with the converters, and then send that out to the screen. And if you say, well, no, I have a cabinet here, which is a JAMA standard, orig original cabinet, say I have a Street Fighter 2 or Mortal Kombat cabinet that I want to keep, Original, you have your choice and buttons again, which is your input where everything starts. Goes into your jammer cable, to your uh, game, which will output on other pins to the cable to your screen. And then, okay, you have an arcade cabinet, you want a PC in there, you start off again with your uh, buttons, and joysticks into the cable. This goes into the, the JPEG, which will now act as an iPad and translate all, of, all, all your buttons and joysticks into commands which your PC can understand. Your, your PC will receive them, interpret them. Um, it will make the things move on the screen and output it to your video card or to your uh, software back into the JPEG, which will put it on the cable and out on your screen. And this was the first slide that I showed earlier on. Now, <laughs> we have now covered the hardware. So software, I'm going to cover MAME mostly on, on a white, white level. And they say, well, OK, MAME is really hard to, to configure. Well, yeah, it is. But you can, with some, with some tricks, you can make your life a bit easier and this, this took me the good of six, seven months to find out and to figure everything. And now I am sharing information with you. So MAME exists in many, ver many versions. You have, uh, you have your standard build, your, your mother build, which is uh, now uh, made for um, the Windows platform. You, you, you have ports towards different uh, operating systems, computers, um, and also uh, various hacks or um, features which have been added. Um, if you want a, a, a main version which um, supports 3D accelerations, you need a separate build. If you want a main version which will allow saving of high scores, which we will come to later, you need a separate build and you need to all, all put all these together. The good thing is they all use the same configuration file, which is what we can abuse. 
but first you need to create anything. If you if you if you download mame mame dot zip and you unpack it and you start it, it will say I, I don't have a config file. You, you're you're dead in the water. You need to create a config file first, and then it will spit out some text files, which you can start editing. But editing, yeah, that's typing commands. You know, you have you have uh, you have you have a mouse and you have a GUI. So um, there is a GUI version of MAME, MAME UI 32. It's slow as hell, but you can use it to configure everything so you don't need to edit the, the, the five gazillion text files, which exists all over uh, the folder. Um, and also use it to uh, configure the player controls. The player controls are set to a certain default. Uh, best thing to do is, what I do is, I delete everything. Just uh, take a selection, hit escape, so it's empty and assigned to none, which will prevent you from getting ghost commands, say, if you have, if you reconfigure your arcade system that you have, um, say, um, a certain button, say, S, to go up. If, if it is reconfigured somewhere in the back on the hidden Mahjong setting, it can still give a false key, uh, and you, you don't know where it comes from. So erase everything, and then one by one, go to your buttons. You say button, so up you go up, down you go down, left, right. This will take you 10 minutes to go through everything, and you will have set it up. If you do it in the defaults, it will be set for all your games. Um, some exceptions left and right, but yeah, good luck if you really play those games. I salute you. Um, a main UI quirk is that it will localize your um, key inputs, by the way. You can safely ignore this as long as you don't copy your um, config file to another machine in another language, you won't have an issue. If not, you repeat the process. It takes you five minutes. Now, because it was too good to be true that everything was in one, in one position, there is a submenu which overrides your coin uh, registration and your start button. You have to, there is a, an, an other controls menu in MAME where you set this. Um, if you go uh, back to your player screen here, you, you'll see player one start, player two start, coin one and coin two. Those are your start buttons for player one and player two and, and the coin mechanisms that, they, okay, you, you have uh, 50 cents or a quarter in there. These settings will quite often not work because in an other menu they are uh, repeated it play one start and the coins, and actually these are the ones that work, the other ones don't. And also remember to save. It's only when you have done all the settings, you have cleanly gone out of the menu with return to previous, return to previous, return to game, and then exit your game that your settings will save. If you say, well, okay, it's, it's, it's now done, you quit, you, you quit menu, your, your settings will not be there. Uh, this was my problem, which took me one hour to figure out why it wouldn't save my settings in the beginning. Um, another option which, is, which you need to disable, certainly when you're using um, uh, Windows, I'm not really sure how, how it works in other operating systems because I'm, I'm a Windows guy, is, 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 is a feature called um, sticky keys, which exists in the accessibil accessibility options. Um, what it does is it will allow you to zoom your screen, if your eyesight is not that good, it will, it will enable um, speech recognition, it will do text-to-speech, and this is all bound to start. If you say press control twice, it will activate. If you press alt twice, it will activate. Thing is, those keys are also connected to your button one, two, and three in MAME. So when you are suddenly doing a, um, um, a, a nice rail shooter, you will suddenly have a window pop up. Would you like to enable sticky keys? which you don't want, so you have to switch it off. It's in your control panel, and it's in the accessibility options. You have the sticky keys, you have the filter keys, and you have the toggle keys. I'll just call them all together, and it, they are the sticky keys, and you have to disable them all three, but you have a settings button, and it's only when you also empty the settings button that it's completely deactivated, or else it will, it will come back to, to haunt you. And as we said now, saving high scores, there is a special version of MAME which will allow you to save your high score. You have a high score dot that, which is a file of memory addresses where each game, say for instance, uh, well, uh, Street Fighter 2, 
saves its high score table. It will dump that to a file and when loading, load it back so you have your old high scores because MAME is really true to the fact that it emulates your arcade game in the same way as it is in the arcade itself. Meaning that if it does not save a high score on the arcade, it will not save it in MAME by default. You need a special version for that. Um, it's quite common um, to just replace this again. It's another executable, drop it in the main folder of MAME, it will pick up the same configuration files, but it will add the high score saving. Same for cheating. There is um, like an um, what, okay, most C64 Amiga guys here, you know, trainers for unlimited liars, energy, uh, level skip. What you do is you write information to a certain mem memory address. The cheat.dat is also a file which, which has a list of memory addresses and options which you can then uh, um, edit and change. So it, it, it can give you a limited life's energy. Um, this works in most standard main versions, but you have to enable it in the menu to allow it. And then you will have a cheat menu where you can edit all the things if you really want to finish the game. Of course, you can just give yourself unlimited credits because, well, you, you have an arcade machine of yourself now. Um, and when you have it all configured, you have a front end. Most knowns are Maximus Arcade or Hyperspin. Um, I could do an entire seminar on this, just know that they exist. I use Maximus Arcade. They are not that easy to configure, but once you have it, you will usually never have to, have to touch your config again. And for some tips and tricks to end, um, if you use, certainly, um, if you use the, the cheaper CPU boards, which are on the market, mo mostly um, um, Atom-based these days, an Atom CPU is not powerful enough to run MAME. MAME is quite CPU in, in, in intensive, more than you think. So what you could have is that your sound starts stuttering and that you have things slowing down. And there is an option which you can enable, which is um, automatic frame skipping. So your game will drop from 60 to 55 to f uh, 54 frames a second, depending on your resolution. Um, it's not really noticeable, but your sound will at least not um, stutter anymore because that has lower priority than everything. Uh, this is something I, I always enable, uh, just in case, even on a powerful PC, with um, it doesn't um, well, enable it. That's it. Um, and also, if you have a modern screen and you want the old retro scan lines, you can add a PNG overlay which will fake the scan lines. It's, it, it's, it's not perfect, but it gives you a retro feeling. Some people like this. Um, note that some TVs don't like the setting uh, and will completely crap out and uh, disable it in that case. And as I said, MAME is a single core to the extreme. Uh, why? Because what MAME does internally is uh, emulating different, uh, multiple CPUs, multiple chips, and the, the timing is critical, so, you, so it's really hard to offload certain parts to a second CPU to a second core. What you can do is an option that the, the internal thread of MAME, where it outputs and builds your screen on your local PC, you can offload that to a different CPU to a different core. Uh, it's, um, it's a command line option uh, that, that you need to uh, do. It will, it will give you, uh, depending on your PC, about 5% of uh, a CPU gain, but not enough. If, if, your, if your audio is stuttering, this will not fix it. It's, it does not give you enough um, advantage and help. So, in the end, it's your, your config will never be finished. You can always tweak things left, you can always tweak things uh, right. Um, also keep in mind that um, MAME works with strict versioning. If you have a version, say, 125, it will recognize games by the file name of the ROM files of the zip file, which can change in between versions. So if you want to really start, you need a ROM set of, of that version and use your MAME of the same version so it will recognize everything and also with all the extra um, um, patches and fixes for high score saving, for, uh, for, for cheating uh, the, the MAME UI with, uh, with the GUI, for instance. Uh, you, also, you also need that put together. Now, um, 
on the older games, 80s and 90s, not much changes. So you can, you can if you have a, a selection and, and a ROM set of, say, uh, 18 months ago, it, it'll work fine. There is not really a need to upgrade unless you really want to. Um, I usually don't upgrade. And before somebody asks, no, you may not have my ROM set. It's, um, it's, there are, um, the search engines and, and the torrent sites, sites will help you. They're not that easy to, uh, to get, actually. And so far for the software as well. So now, f now for the real question session. Questions? <laughs> I, I, we'll get the microphone to you. Uh, when you talked about video conversion, yes. does the video conversion in any way affect the gameplay in any way, like latency problems or if you're going from like 31 kilohertz to 15 no. kilohertz, it doesn't affect it in any way? No, there, no. It, there are, I have never seen any latency problems at all. Okay. Thank you. That answers my question. Okay. Nobody else? Okay. Next. Okay, I guess that's it then. One more. There's gonna be questions. Come on, such a complicated topic. In the back. Um, at one point you were talking about this uh, software which enables you to um, make the PC video card output uh, 15 kilohertz signal, soft 15, right? Soft 15, yes. Yeah, but uh, can't you do it with a uh, program called PowerStrip or similar, which can actually add new um, uh, video mode options for um, the uh, well, well, Windows? Yes. What you are doing is you, you are adding video modes. You, yes. are, you are adding the registry values, which will allow your video card to, to, to enable these... Yeah. Uh, these uh, video modes, yes. So if you, uh, well, you can do it with Regedit. If if you know the keys, you can do it yourself. Uh, yeah. But, but but things like you need power strip is also an option. I use Soft 15. Yeah, I was just thinking if if uh, there are like f some um, preset files for power strip or similar software in the uh, arcade enthusiast forums. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't. I don't really. I don't really follow uh, power strip, sir. Okay. Thanks, that was my question. Okay. How much does a, uh, uh, if you make a arcade cabinet, how much does it cost? Um, if you are looking at, in parts, um, if you t take everything from the control panel, the, 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 the eye pack, the cabling, the power supply, in parts, 175, 200 euros is your start in parts without the wooden box to put everything in. What is the expensive part? Um, the expensive part is uh, your control panel. It's um, if, you, if you make it a, s a simple control panel with one joystick and three buttons will be a lot cheaper than going for the two player six button Street Fighter layout because um, a button is uh, about three euros, a joystick is 25 euros, so that's, that's where your multiplication cost comes in. More questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks.